Good morning, my fellow yogic travelers. I'm mighty glad to be alive today, and I hope that you are too as we continue to live, laugh, love, learn, linger, live the life we love. Well, the Lord of the Dancer, Shiva, Shiva Nataraj, and uh, once there were like a uh, hundred thousand wicked rishis who were like taking over the world, and so Shiva had to come and deal with them. And he came with his wife Parvati, and they both cast such an, uh, an enchanting visage that all the rishis were confused. That's like, what was this energy going on? But then they realized, listen, this is Shiva and Parvati. They're probably going to take over our power. So they tried to do an evil incantation on them, and it didn't work. So then they created this huge tiger. But Shiva took his fingernail and ripped the tiger apart and wore his skin as a cloak. Then they sent this huge serpent after him, but he just wrapped it around his neck. As you see in the iconography, of, he has that big serpent around his neck like a garland. And then they tried to, sh to show another demon, and then he just stamped on the demon, as you can see in the picture of Shiva Nataraj dancing with his foot on the demon of ignorance. Everybody fell before him, and the Rishis decided to become devotees of Shiva. So off Shiva and Parvati went on the white bull into the northern paradise. And then Adishesha, the serpent Ananta, that Vishnu, lies on Vishnu's couch. He said, oh, I want to go see Shiva's dancing form one more time. And so Vishnu said, go. And he incarnated as an as a ascetic. And he did such severe austerities that Shiva finally came to him and says, I will give you the boon you want. You've earned the joys of heaven by your austerities. And then he touched him and gave him the true teaching, which reads like this. The universe of seeming forms is made of appearances as the pot is of the clay. The instrument by which it is performed as the pot by the stick and the wheel is Parvati, my wife, and I, the first cause, the potter himself, I am. My dance, which you long to see, is the source of all movement and all action and its five aspects of creation, preservation, destruction, embodiment, and release. The place of the dance, whether it seems to be a sacred shrine or an unclean burning ground of corpses, is in reality the human heart. Leave now, follow my teaching, and you may find the shrine where you will see my dance again and again and all its secrets, and it will be known to you, for it all takes place within. All right, so I hope you find your dancing Shiva and uh, dance with the called the Leela of Life, which includes both the grandeur and also the misery. Hard to wrap our heads around this paradox, but that's the way it is. All right, for my writing journal friends, my question for you today is what role has inspiration played in your life and how has your education complemented and influenced your creativity? How has inspiration played a part in your life and how has your own education complemented and influence your creativity. Now, from the yoga point of view, my teacher would always say, the yoga sutras don't begin with transcendence, they begin with common sense. A dull body begets a dull mind. A distracted body gets a distracted mind. So if we're ignorant of the body, which the ancients never did, they understood the wisdom of the body as the temple of the living divine, and we denigrate the value of the body. So if you ignore the body temple, you're going to be in trouble because you'll make choices that won't be good for you in terms of the long-lasting effects of its karma. The second thing, of course, is not only take care of your body, take care of your mind. So this is where meditation comes in. If your mind is inundated with agitation and turbulence, it gets no insight. And if the goal of liberation is to eradicate the habits that create suffering, you got to watch the way you think. Stinking thinking ain't going to help you. So first, most important for yogis is to use right speech. Like the Jewish tradition says, nothing is so more sing singly determinative of whether or not you merit a portion in the world to come than the quality of your speech while you were alive. <clears throat> so use right speech not to slander, not to gossip, not to chatter, not to quarrel, not to be harsh with one another, but to be worthy, to reconcile, to rejoice, to bring up, to be helpful, to say things that are worthy to be remembered, to say things that are well-timed and well-chosen, and watch the karmic effects of that. I hope everybody understands that and does a better job than most people are doing. It's our job to lead the way. Now, all the initiations happen through some kind of ordeal, as if something is trying to be verified and validated and how it works out in our life. And so 
You can use any circumstance in your life to sort this out. So if you take the hero's journey, you know you're going to have to separate yourself from everything you know and what you're accustomed to. And then do battle with whatever life brings before you, presents before you. And then, of course, you have to come back to your community as a different person at a different level with gifts to share in order to reincorporate yourself. And while we're doing this, uh, I always like to bring the Holocaust insights. When you realize that in some way to be a human being, part of your own life and destiny is to suffer. And to accept your own suffering as the most singular and unique task, because each person suffers in a different way. They express it in a different way. They try to heal themselves in a different way. They bear it in a different way. No one can suffer for you in place, just like no one can hit the mat for you by proxy. No one can do this for you. And so maybe the only thing you can do is to learn to bear your burden with dignity. The greatest courage we have maybe is the courage to suffer. So I hope each one of us can find the strength to deal with what we have to. We are made for this and we have the capacity. Are we willing to do it is the really question. And then last, keep the positive thinking going. There's so much to make us think negatively or go along with the mob. And our job is to, uh, to remind ourselves. First of all, prior to going to sleep, one of the simplest ways you can do it, turn over your request to your subconscious mind. Believe that the subconscious mind has the power to give you and fulfill what you're asking. And keep it busy with positive expectation, not negative anticipation. And then your subconscious mind will faithfully reproduce what your habitual thinking continues to bring before your inner eye. So you want to find out if it's true? You got to try. You got everything to gain and nothing to lose. So have an intention, put it in your mind like in virtual reality, feel good about it while you're doing it. And this is also called pre-paving the road by envisioning ahead of time what it is you want, like making a blueprint for the house you're going to build. And then hopefully you'll find what I call the biology of hope by doing things that help create the dopamine, the oxytocin, the serotonin, the endorphins, and all those other positive chemicals, enzymes that we have in us that make us think feel and act like the beautiful people who we really are deep within ourselves bring it to the surface have a great day hopefully we'll see you tomorrow